Okay, if people would take their seats, please. Um, need glasses. Oops. I'm Martin Sandu the from the Financial one. Times. It's uh, my pleasure to chair the last panel uh, of the day, another <laughs> fantastic <laughs> panel with an excessively ambitious uh, topic, like, like all of them here, but that's what we're here for, to try to understand a little bit better all the big questions. This is the panel, this is the panel on the international economic and financial order after the pandemic and the war, uh, which is based on the, is it the fifth Barcelona report, I think? S somebody can nod or? Yes, it yes. is. Yes. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah. um, and it has nothing to do with banking. So, yeah. so we, we have a couple of challenges with, the, with this panel. Uh, one is that we're the last panel, we're the panel between you and drinks. So we will try to keep you entertained. Um, but I've been asked to mention to you, remind you that there are drinks and it's even a cocktail dinatoire, which I, mean, I think means that there'll be some nibbles as well, but it's not in this building. So when you go down afterwards, all the fantastic CEPR staff who've been so helpful uh, will point you in the right direction uh, so that you will get your drinks. Uh, when you do that, you should hold on to your badge for the next 15 days of CEPR conference, however long it is, because of course you'll want to come back for everything. Um, I mean, the other challenge, as you can see, this is a panel with not four, but five panelists. Not only that, but four of the panelists are the guys who wrote the report and will want to tell you all about it. Um, and then Jayla, who will give her reflections on it, which I thought is sort of a bit of an unfair setup. Uh, so I've been very strict with everyone to avoid sort of 50 minutes of, of mansplaining. And, <laughs> and, and I've, 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 I've told everyone um, to take, please, just two, three minutes, uh, and they will speak about one bit of the report each. Uh, I will just say everyone's names because you see them there and we, we all know each other here. But in the order that they will speak, if I've got this, if I put, it, put the little badges down right, we have Xavier Vives, we have Giancarlo Cosetti, we have Barry Eichengreen, uh, we have Jeromin Zetlmeyer, they will each give first an overview and then one chapter each, talk about one chapter each from the report. Uh, and then Chela Pazarbasioglu from the IMF and, and CEPR, who will tell us what we should really think about it, uh, and we'll get some more time, um, because she's the one who didn't write the report, but can, uh, can take a more original and fresh view, right? So I'm not going to say anything more until we've gone through that first round, but uh, you know, try to be as, as uh, succinct as you can so that we can have as much discussion and questions from the audience as possible, because that's a big part of why we're here. Uh, Xavier, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for being here after this very long and very interesting uh, day. And so uh, we'll try to be uh, brief. Uh, so this is the fifth report on the series of the Barcelona uh, report. Uh, this is uh, the joint work with the banking initiative at the SA Business School and is uh, with the support of, uh, of Citi. Um, uh, so let, let me just run through uh, a few seconds for every uh, report that we have uh, done so that you have a little bit the, uh, the, the, the series of what we have been uh, doing. So the first report was in 2019 on uh, assessing a decade of financial uh, uh, regulation after the fall of Lehman Brothers, whether we had done a good job or not. This was by Patrick Bolton, Steve Cecchetti, and Jean-Pierre Dantin. Uh, then we move on, on to the bank business model in the post-COVID-19 uh, world with Elena Carletti, Stein Klesens, and Antonio Fatas, in fact, that was in the, the last uh, uh, panel. Uh, then uh, we move on to the resiliency of the financial system of natural disasters. Uh, this was uh, COVID, uh, climate change, uh, taking a systemic perspective. Uh, the next to the last uh, was a, a report on technology and finance, uh, the impact of digital technology on intermediation and markets with Daryl Duffy, uh, Terry Foucault, and Laura uh, Belkamp. And we come uh, to the uh, report uh, that we will present uh, today uh, with Giancarlo, Barry, and, uh, and Jeremy. Uh, this report, uh, which in fact I think there were a few uh, issues of the report in the, the CPR table at the entrance, um, concentrates on three major aspects of the impact of the war and the pandemic. 
macroeconomic stability and policy, and basically the basic uh, question that we want to, um, to address is whether the policy model uh, should be reformed or not, a little bit in a sense the, on fiscal and monetary policy, the previous panel have talked about that. Uh, uh, second item, uh, looking at the international monetary landscape, and in particular looking at whether, uh, given these shocks uh, and technological developments, the dollar dominance will wane or not. And then finally, sovereign debt. Uh, how big is the sustainability problem? What countries may be in trouble? And the reform also of the uh, European uh, the Union fiscal rules. And then I will just uh, finish my, um, my intervention with, uh, with a, a little bit of the three, uh, I'll tell you a little bit of the three broad messages uh, that uh, the report um, expresses and that it will be um, expounded uh, by the three authors. Uh, the first is that both a stable a fiscal outlook and a credible monetary policy are necessary to attack inflation, but this, uh, uh, we think, will be difficult without reconsidering how fiscal and monetary authorities can remain independent while interacting with regulatory policy in addressing financial vulnerability. Second, the weaponization of the dollar and the rise of China have created an opportunity to promote the international use of the alternative reserve currencies, mainly, for example, the yuan. Uh, uh, but the emergence of these will be gradual unless geopolitical tensions between the US and China escalate significantly, uh, God forbid. Uh, finally, although um, debt remains sustainable in most countries, a subset of uh, European Union countries will need to undertake significantly more debt adjustment than is currently planned. And the uh, European Union fiscal rules will have to be reformed in order to reconcile debt sustainability and stabilization with preserving incentives to, for investment. And now, as we know, all this is uh, very much uh, uh, recent, um, recent developments. Giancarlo. Uh, very, very quickly. <clears throat> I prepare a slide so that I can make it in two minutes. G Giancarlo, can you speak very close yeah, to yeah, the microphone? Close otherwise, to the, to the, the sound microphone. won't carry. So the, the uh, chapter two was uh, shock in progress. I mean, we are working you know, with, with news about inflation and energy crisis, uh, every paragraph I wrote. So what, uh, what uh, the, the question is, uh, part of the chapter is, uh, you know, the re reflection on the inflation crisis, the, the, new, the new context for thinking about macroeconomic policy reform. And then two specific questions. One is how do we think monetary interaction, monetary fiscal interaction forward? And then the other question of the international monetary cooperation. So uh, on the... Oh, sorry, this is, those are not the good, the good slides, but it doesn't matter, I, I'll do without slides. So the, on, 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 the, on the, those are the long words. So, so on, on the inflation crisis, you know, inflation is inflation. Uh, we, we are surprised that we need to go back to the model and find something in the model that we forgot about. Inflation and, and the response of policy to, the, to COVID, sorry, the COVID uh, shock, the response of COVID uh, to, uh, policy to COVID reminded us that there are no demand and supply shock, but all shocks and policies have demand and supply side, that there is no things as a close economy, there is a global spillovers that came especially from the US through tradables to the low one price. So there was a strong in inflation drive globally through the tradables. And remember Friedman, you know, you ask tradable to supply more, he goes all the way to up to energy and commodity and comes back as a cost push because commodity and, 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 and energy start to, uh, the price of which start to increase. And the last bit, the fact that the, you know, the, the, this inflation crisis is also a component driven by a persistent fiscal, fiscal stimulus, which created the Something that to me sounds like, okay, bygones are bygones, we had inflation tradable, now we, we bring up the price level to the tradable level, because doing the opposite would have been extremely costly, because it would have been a, a strong, a strong uh, uh, um, uh, deflationary, deflationary input. So that was a little bit the context. 
uh, in which I, I started to rethink about the question of fiscal monetary interaction. Fiscal monetary interactions were already under stress after the global financial crisis. And where we discovered that with zero lower bound, fiscal and monetary are strategic substitute. When there is no monetary there, you need to push fiscal. But they're also strategic complement, meaning that if they don't do the right thing, they reduce the space of action for each other. There is a common interest in doing the right thing because you create more, more policy, more fiscal policy. This thing changed a little bit with the COVID because we went more, so we, we exploited the substitution and, and, and complementary. At one point, we started to go back on substitution. Fiscal policy was still driving the adjustment, and monetary policy had to decide whether to believe inflation expectation or not. Because if they look at inflation expectation, they could have relaxed a little bit, and now they, they got together, they have swings in opinions, but, and and that, that what we have is the fact that, uh, you know, after all, th there was a need to increase rates. They did, incre they, they did increase rates, but at the, at the point is like a, a normal absorption. What are we left with? Are we left in a model with, with a world in which monetary and fiscal policy need some rethinking? Need some rethinking, if anything, because debt is high. You know, with the high debt, <laughs> the, there is, a, a, again, a complementarity model there that needs to translate into some kind of model of interactions in which you know, we, we can say very clearly that it's stupid to think that you can have stability, financial and macroeconomic stability and sustainability of that without anchor inflation expectation. So we need to keep uh, a, 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 a reasonable regime of anchor inflation expectation in dependent monetary policy, number one. Number two, Fiscal policy needs to understand that there is an interest in what they do to keep inflation expectation reasonably anchored. And, and that creates, of course, the li a link through the fact that we, have, uh, uh, we, we are taking risk. Somebody before, I, I wrote a paper called Gambling on Price Stability. You know, we are, for many years, we're always waiting for the next, the next, I finish. The, the next, uh, the next. So the, the, the chapter goes on and on in this kind of how do we think the, the new mode of collaboration, which I think is work in progress. And last bit, the, the fact that, remember, there is no cooperation in view of disinflation. There is still rock of that reminded us that if we cooperate, we lose credibility, except in the currency market. And in the currency market, I think this is the, where, the dollar, where the dog did not bark, or maybe we're not listening. The dollar went a, a lot of up. The, the crisis we expected was not there. I suspect that there was a lot of cooperation, not on the plaza accord at the dollar level, but with the swap lines. And with lots of, of ongoing uh, uh, collaboration that sort of kept things together. This is the chapter. So Thank you very much. Barry. Don't, don't even have notes. Um, so uh, for my, my chapter, I was tasked with asking how the um, international monetary and financial order would be affected by three sets of changes. Number one, Russia's uh, attack on Ukraine and the financial measures taken by the United States and other countries in response. Um, Number two, uh, the rise of, uh, of China and the possible development of uh, alternative clearing mechanisms and so forth. And number three, everything else that uh, is occurring in the digital sphere, uh, including but not limited to uh, the emission of central bank digital currencies. So we have presented this report uh, before um, and, and, and been given more time to present it. And when, my, when I present it to other audiences, my answer to those questions, how will the above affect the international monetary and financial order is less than you presumably uh, uh, assume. This is a, a sophisticated audience, so you already have some reasons to doubt that there will be far-reaching changes in, in the order because of what we have seen. So. Um, financial sanctions, they are not being imposed unilaterally by the United States, they are being imposed by the United States and the issuers of uh, virtually of all the other consequential actual and potential international and, and reserve currencies. So China notwithstanding, to the contrary, 
if you don't want to hold your reserves in the United States, use SWIFT and uh, transact with US banks. You don't have a lot of places to go. Um, so that's the, the first third. Um, the middle third, what about China? Um, I think uh, China is making slower progress uh, on this front than we, we read about in the newspapers. It has been at work since 2017 to build its alternative to the New York and, and London clearinghouses, the cross-border interbank payments system, which clears by value daily 2%. The transactions that are cleared in New York has by number 10% the participating banks. So there are some uh, aspirational agreements, like the one last week between Saudi Arabia and China to do more clearing um, uh, bilaterally in their own currencies. But when, when you look at it, it's really um, countries that, like Russia, that are in special circumstances that do a lot of business with China anyway that are using SIPs and holding uh, the renminbi uh, as reserves. There are, are the obvious financial obstacles and uh, somewhat less obvious, but I think equally important political obstacles to take up of China's currency by other countries around the world whose officials know that the Chinese can change the rules of the game and, th and, and, and that makes them pause. Finally, on, on, on central bank digital currencies, uh, I'm a skeptic. Uh, I'm, I'm not in denial that important things are happening in the digital sphere that will affect payments, first and foremost. And insofar as they affect payments, they will affect the, uh, the mechanisms and the currencies with which uh, other cross-border transactions are done. But many, many of those other things that are happening fly under the name instant payment systems that are being linked across borders, uh, universal payment interfaces that are banking the unbanked, uh, uh, experiments by um, Western Union and SWIFT itself to use blockchain technology that have nothing to do with central bank digital currencies and are, and are, are moving ahead without them. Thanks so much. Yeah, Thank you. So, so I was tasked with the fiscal architecture chapter, and, and basically this uh, chapter looks at three issues. First, it, it has a sort of a relatively crude attempt to quantify the reduction in fiscal space around the world as a result of the combination of pandemic, energy shock, and uh, um, higher real interest rates. Uh, second, it looks at the discussion on the EU fiscal framework, and finally it says something about uh, debt uh, restructuring architecture, particularly in, in, um, in, in low-income countries. And sort of the common element of these three is that you know, I'm trying to look at areas where there have been, if you like, sec secular changes, or where secular changes are underway, sort of, that are likely to have a medium-term impa impact, even if they're not necessarily causally related to, to the pandemic and, um, and, and the crisis, so that it, they would be causally related on fiscal space, but not so much on, on what has happened on debt uh, in, uh, necessarily in low-income countries. And so the, basically the main results are, first, if, if you sort of take, uh, make the heroic assumption that IMF uh, WIO projections look sort of five years out, look through the cycle, uh, in some sense, and give you give you a sense of, you know, how e economies are likely to adjust and how fiscal accounts are likely to adjust following a large shock. One way to quantify the fiscal impact of pandemic and uh, energy shocks is to compare five-year projections from the perspective of October 2019, just before the pandemic, and from the perspective of today, right? So they, they look ahead, they give you the medium term perspective. And so if you look at the debt drivers, based on such projections, the stylized result is that uh, fiscal space as measured by the increase in the debt stabilizing primary balance five years out has gone down by about one point of GDP. So that's not a dramatic number, it's less than I expected to find. Now, the, the, the asterisk here is that, you know, while debt stabilizing primary balances have not gone up all that much, actual uh, 
current primary balances are, of course, far in deficit. So the work that you need to do to get to that medium-term target is a lot more today than it was in 2019. Okay, but provided you can do this slowly enough, which may raise financing issues in some countries, you should be able to get there, right? And so in that sense, this is a relatively sanguine message for at least for advanced uh, countries. Now you would want then, that brings me to part two of the chapter, a fiscal framework that both sort of supports and you know, creates commitment to do this adjustment, but also leaves countries enough time to do it, right? And so in principle, the uh, fiscal framework that is being discussed in the EU today meets this, right? And then there is this messy trade-off between creating commitment uh, and uh, creating uh, rigidities that make adjustment more difficult, that needs to be navigated. And here I'm, you know, more or less on board with what Dorothee said in the in the previous panel that, and what Olivier said, namely that DSAs are, are a nice way of, if you like, tailoring uh, adjustment needs by country. Then you have to create an institutional framework around it that doesn't throw too many additional arbitrary safeguards uh, in it. So that's also a position we I have uh, advocated. Okay, so on the, on the final point, uh, which is um, uh, debt restructuring in emerging markets and low-income uh, countries. So what has happened here uh, over the last 10 years, roughly, uh, and so mainly not as a result of pandemic and war, but as a result of other secular changes, is you know, in part an increase in debt burdens. Uh, and in another paper, which I still wrote uh, when I was at the IMF, and by the way, Jayla here is my, my boss from the IMF, so that, that you know, is a commitment device against too much man mansplaining. Um, we, we, we showed that you know, the increase in, in low-income country debt, if you look at sort of solvency indicators, yes, it has become a lot worse, but it's still quite far off from where it was directly before the HIPIC uh, initiative when it was sort of over overwhelming, right? Uh, so the sort of silence fact is, yes, it's, you know, debt burdens have gone up, but the, but the big complication is not so much the levels of debt as the debt structure, right? And so here the silence fact is debt over the last 10 years or so has become qu quite a bit harder to restructure, particularly in low-income countries for, for two reasons. First, the debtor composition uh, among the bilateral creditors has changed with China um, uh, being about as large as all Paris Club creditors combined. Uh, and then the, the other fact is that multilateral debt, so development banks, IMF, uh, also have a significantly higher share of debt than they used to have, right? And, and so both of these things make debt harder to restructure. On the one hand, you know, multilateral debt is not supposed to be restructured. Uh, and on the other hand, you know, the institutions that we have to do official debt relief are really focused on the Paris Club. And so integrating China in those institutions is, is very difficult. So, so what do we do in, in such a situation? Well, um, we do three or four things. I mean, f first of all, let, let's try and keep the, the, the set of preferred multilateral institutions as small as we can, right? And, and so at, when I was still at the IMF, we did some work on this indirectly by, by uh, trying to restrict the number of multilateral institutions that the IMF treats as a preferred uh, creditor. Second, you've got to try and work with China, obviously, and uh, I'm not gonna say anything about that because I know Jayla is gonna give you the latest uh, on that, e except for one sentence. If people say the common framework is stupid, and needs to be reformed, always think that the common framework, which is an, an essentially an attempt to extend Paris Club rules to China, is a symptom, right? Not a cause of problems. It's an attempt to un address an underlying fundamental problem, and you cannot simply view it as a policy uh, lever that can be switched with you know, one, one flick. It's, it's sort of work to make this gradually function better. Uh, the holy grail, I think, would be, and I, th I think we will need to do this, particularly in low-income countries, to shift towards less debt-creating or non-debt-creating forms of development finance, right? So obviously this is going to be grants, but probably it also has to be some kind of equity participation, some equity tranches that are financed by the official sector that then de-risk private financing. The nice thing about that is once you have sucked in the private financing, if things don't go well, those guys you can uh, restructure, no problem, okay? So I think it's a, it's a good way to go to make the, <laughs> the whole thing, of course you can't tell them before, otherwise they won't come. And you know, 
there is a lot more risk than being absorbed by the public sector. And then the final uh, idea which we push, and actually it's an idea that we already pushed last year in, in the Geneva report last year, is, th is this notion that you know, given increasing climate-related problems, there is a set of developing countries out there, low-income but also sort of small island states, where adaptation really becomes a solvency issue, right? Whether you adapt to climate change or not is going to have an ability on a, a, an impact of your ability to repay on your creditworthiness. In in a setting like that, it does make sense to condition debt relief on adaptation measures in in a way uh, sort of beyond the usual um, macro conditionality, and that in principles is in the interest of all creditors, uh, also China. But we we need to sort of embed this more into the institutional framework. And again, at the fund while I was there, we we sort of tried to to do initial steps in that direction. Thanks so much, and thanks all of you for almost sticking to my impossible uh, time demands. But what, what I take from that is that we're not doomed, but we may need to be quite innovative with our institutions in some areas. Uh, but, Shayla, you can be much more sophisticated than that, so we look forward to hearing it's your a thoughts. Great, it's a great report. We can go to the cocktail. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, I, um, it, I was... Thank you. I was wondering why these these reports are supposed to be on banking sector issues. So I was wondering what I, I kept thinking as I looked at the report and also listened to you now. How do we? How does this link to the banking sector? And I worked quite a lot on the banking sector issues. So that's what I'm going to uh, try to do. And I will just go on each of the um, uh, the chapters, which I thought was really well summarized just now. On monetary fiscal policy, regulatory policy, this was just discussed in the panel before, so I'm not going to go too much into it. But one issue that you raised at the end, which is about the currency risks and the swap line, I think that's very important because there was a lot of collaboration among central banks, and precisely because they were very worried about implications on the potentially on the banking sector. This came especially at a time when you had the, uh, if you remember the problems with Credit Suisse and SNB and so on. So I think the collaboration among different central banks is something that um, is very important and, and will have to be broadened to other uh, central banks. It's now limited to a, a small group of banks. In terms of, um, uh, I agree with all the, the, the the messages about the need to anchor inflationary expectations and uh, and so on. One additional aspect to the coordination issue, you know, monetary policy, fiscal policy, financial sector policies, is now the new set of policies that are uh, coming up, which are industrial policies. And these have implications, both fiscal as well as, of course, uh, in, in terms of monetary policy. So, it, looking at the interactions between these uh, policies and, and coordination is going to be very important going forward. On the IMS, the International Monetary System, I agree with uh, what Barry said, that this th there are concerns, but most likely this is going to be gradual and um, uh, you know, I, I think that the reasons you explained that, the, that there are no alternatives right now, but that doesn't mean those alternatives will be developed. There is a lot of work on interoperability of um, uh, real-time gross settlements, cross-border payments, and so on. I will talk more about sovereign debt fiscal risks because this is a key concern for us right now. You must have heard, uh, you may have heard rather, um, uh, the, the latest um, uh, the reports as well as uh, thinking from the fund that we are at a very delicate space in terms of fiscal risks. Uh, uh, already Jeremy mentioned the lack of fiscal space, uh, the drains on, this was discussed in earlier panels, the, disc the, the drains on fiscal authorities. We have now um, you know, insurer of first resort uh, f since COVID. There is this entitlement mentality. It was discussed also in the earlier panel that once these measures are taken, it's very difficult to uh, take them back. But also um, because of the political economy aspects of it, there are lots <laughs> of demands on fiscal authorities, both in terms of uh, you know, providing safety nets, the climate transition, which is uh, very expensive, and, and has fiscal implications. There's, of course, also 
um, uh, the defense expenditures, unfortunately, given where we are uh, recently. So the drains and the aging populations, which is nothing new, but becoming more binding in many countries. So there is a lot of fiscal demands coming on the, on the authorities and it's uh, at a time when debt is at record high levels. So I want to say a few words on, on, on uh, debt issues and on the work that we have been, uh, we have been doing. Debt is at um, very high levels, 112% uh, of uh, GDP, global GDP in 2023 uh, for advanced economies and 69% for emerging market economies. This is... Um, uh, similar to the peak after the Second World War. So historic highs, growing fiscal uh, risks because of the spending after COVID and the war and energy related issues and so on and so forth. And all the demands I just outlined on the needs for you know, defense spending, climate transition, public investment needs and all that, if you add them all up, they are very sizable. They're about 7% of GDP for advanced economies, about $6 trillion. This is a very large number by 2030. And five points, uh, about 8% of GDP in emerging market economies. So very large uh, uh, amounts, which will put a lot of strain on um, you know, stabilizing uh, primary balance. Now we also have interest rate increases, so that also complicates. For advanced economies, um, Olivier talked about it, uh, others talked about it. It depends also on the debt carrying capacity. It's very important who carries the debt, who are the holders of debt. Japan is an example. You know, they are at... Uh, they're a huge outlier, but they have been able to manage uh, these levels. So I think on advanced economies, it's unlikely, unless there's a major shock, that we would have the type of sudden shocks that um, that uh, um, we talked about, that was talked about a little earlier um, uh, today. Now, emerging markets, as uh, you know, I thought the presentation was excellent. They have shown remarkable resilience in. Uh, given all these adverse, adverse shocks. We have some emerging markets that are in difficulties, but by and large, um, a, a majority of emerging markets have been very resilient, and I think some of the issues that were discussed earlier, earlier the buffers, the credibility of the monetary policy, um, less uh, effects that, and, and so on, has, has helped. But as this chart shows, there are huge pressures on emerging markets as well, both in terms of debt levels, but also the increasing interest rate is really leading to the debt servicing costs to increase very sharply. And here, the, um, you know, the opposite of um, impact of having less FX debt by, but more domestic debt has implications as well because this now becomes the bank sovereign nexus and this is the link to the banking sector because they are mainly the holders of domestic debt. And this is a concern we have. It's much harder to restructure domestic debt because of the implications on financial stability and um, this uh, remains a key issue. In terms of low-income countries, Jerome talked about it. It, we are not uh, at all at HIPIC levels. Uh, many of the indicators are actually much better for most of the countries. We have about 15% of low-income countries that are at high risk, and most of them are restructuring their debt already. And about 40% more additional are at high risk of debt distress. But you know that doesn't mean they'll go into debt crisis, usually. Um, for within three years, the risk is eight to 14 percent that they go from that uh, distress to um, actual risk, this actual crisis. So I think um, we need to be careful in thinking that we are at the uh, verge of a systemic crisis. But I'm going to end with what the the key concern is, and that's uh, the high interest rate, the very large um, record high debt and difficulties in reducing deficits, the fiscal uh, stance. And the, the difficulties in terms of uh, putting domestic resource mobilization efforts in place. And what that means is this funding squeeze, the liquidity risks 
are becoming the major problem right now. And we don't have any systemic approaches for that. You discussed common framework, that's for, that was designed actually to address both debt sustainability and debt liquidity problems. It has never been used so far for dealing with debt liquidity, which means reprofiling of debt, but that's what we really need to concentrate uh, going forward. And I'll stop there and can take questions. Amazing, very, very interesting and extremely rich, the, all the presentations together. Let's have a few, uh, we should be able to fit a few rounds of questions in, so let me see if anyone has questions yet. I have plenty of them, but okay, very good, yes, please. Excellent panel, and I realize it started super optimistic and then kind of dwindled down to more and more pessimism, <laughs> it sounds like. But, which makes a lot of sense, of course. I mean, obviously, Jayla, you know, uh, has to bring up all these issues, which is very important, but it goes back to the start and the fiscal, right? It comes back to the fiscal. And I, I did not hear what the global cooperation should be exactly on this point. Because if you go back to you know the fiscal and debt and all that, the 2021 should be the lesson, right? So that year, we had inflation. This is the year known as central banks missed inflation. But there was slack in the economies, right? So you have still unemployment and you have inflation. And the fiscal policy came marching down the road. You know, we can debate successful or not successful. But in a, in a world that is fragmented, this is going to happen again and again and again. So if we are going to be in that world where inflation is going to be an issue because of these frequency of supply shock and you have this labor market problem, right? The, the governments are going to have, you know, expansion of fiscal policy. And then as putting as John Gordon said, okay, you just like do your thing in your country is not going to solve it. And swap lines is not going to solve it because emerging markets are out of the swap lines. So emerging markets are 50% of world GDP, over 60% of world growth, but they are not in swap lines. And so they, they, they won't be able to do anything in this type of liquidity shock. So how do we solve that problem? I mean, I, you know, what can multilateral institutions do? I mean, to me, obvious answer is, you know, to prevent the world from fragmenting, you know, really push back <laughs> against that geopolitical force. But if we, if that's not possible because of geopolitical driven, what is the second best for the multilateral institutions to do? Fantastic. That, that was a very rich question, but let's take Hélène and Nicolas and then we try to address all of it. Thank you very much. So because it's also uh, on the uh, international financial system and on the fiscal side a bit, so I was wondering whether we have any new measures or any uh, information really about the size of uh, fiscal evasion, uh, the growth of offshore financial centers, the uh, money laundering uh, issues and whether they are linked to some extent, both to geopolitical fragmentation, but also to this emergence of uh, all kinds of weird uh, cryptocurrencies. So whether the IMF has, for example, a way of monitoring this or some guesses, or it, it would, be, would be interesting. Thank you. And Nicolas. Yeah, uh, Nicolas Veron. Uh, to Barry, you gave, in a way, a very sanguine view of a world that isn't changing as much as the media would uh, make you believe, uh, make one believe in, uh, in terms of the financial sector. So I'm tempted to ask you a question a bit to push you. Has the financial world um, fragmented at all in the recent years, or is it basically the same picture as we would have had, say, five years ago? Thanks very much. Uh, maybe let's take... Barry and Chayla first, because some of the questions were uh, directed to you, and then I'll ask any of you who want to come in on, you know, how do we get the corporation going that, that Chairman was talking about uh, after that. But first, Barry and Chayla, please. So there are plenty of uh, important financial changes going on out there, including some that uh, look a lot like fragmentation um, that were not the subject of my particular chapter, but if you look at the, uh, the FDI data, it shows that uh, dramatic collapse of bilateral FDI between the US and China, and some evidence of the same, in, and, and, and same investment flows being diverted to other countries. Um, Mexico and Brazil have benefited, a variety of Southeast Asian countries have benefited as assembly platforms for uh, goods that had previously been shipped directly from 
China to the United States, we don't know exactly. But um, so a lot could be said about financial <coughs> fragmentation ongoing, about um, uh, fragmentation of trade as well, but probably not by me. Tilly, you want to address the question on evasion, anti-money laundering, and so on? Yeah, I will um, start with Shebnam's question. I think uh, it, is a, it is the case that many emerging market countries don't have access to swap lines, and, and even if they do, it's, it's um, relatively limited. And that's why they have been building their own buffers. That's why they have excess reserves. And also a little um, play, you know, plug to IMF work, we have the precautionary facilities. We have Chile, Mexico, Colombia, Colombia Peru, um, more recently Morocco. So we have quite a few countries that have been um, uh, using these precautionary facilities, which are basically um, for tail risks or, or shocks that, that uh, can happen to these countries. And uh, it is reserved for what we call the, the countries with sound fundamentals and sound policies. So it, for a li you know the creme de la creme or, or countries with um, uh, good prospects. And we have other instruments for other countries, but this is purely liquidity support in, in the case of a, of a, of a negative shock. Um, on global cooperation, what we have also been uh, trying to do a lot is um, bring different parties together, uh, a common framework or other debt restructurings out outside of the common framework have been, it has been difficult, there has been delays, and one thing we have done is we formed this Global Sovereign Debt Roundtable, which brings the Paris Club creditors, non-Paris Club creditors, especially China, Saudi Arabia, India, and so on, borrowing countries as well as the private sector all together in, and, and to discuss what are the impediments to debt restructuring and how can we reach shared understanding. We started this about a year ago. I had very low expectations when we started it, but it has been uh, actually quite useful in um, unlocking some of the key impediments that, um, uh, that were uh, creating difficulties for individual country debt restructuring. On Helen's question, this is a great, great question. Um, I mean, it, yes, there's a lot of work on AML, CFD, and trying to monitor institutional setup of countries monitoring it themselves. But these are so difficult to monitor, so difficult to track, I think it would be heroic to say, yes, we have it really well monitored and, uh, and understood. But I agree with you that this is a, a key part of the, uh, of the agenda in terms of what we call uh, domestic resource mobilization. Because if you look at countries, some of the low income countries in particular, 50, 60% of their own resources are flowing outside of their countries. And therefore, you know, we talk about their climate challenges, their development challenges, and so on. And yet, at the same time, you have all these governance issues. So it is a critical agenda, but you need a lot of cooperation with uh, many stakeholders to be able to make progress. Thanks very much. I'd like to see if the other three, either of you, want to say something about the uh, Shabnam's question about global cooperation. I just want to add one element to the question that you may answer or ignore. Uh, we haven't heard anything about the G20, which surprised me a little bit because in the global financial crisis, we sort of thought, oh, G20 can be the new committee to save the world, right? And of course, it's all, it's all gone now. So any reflections on that in terms of how we cooperate? You, you Shayla. Yeah. I, yes. I just say one thing because it's uh, mea culpa. The GSDR, the Global Sovereign Debt Roundtable, is actually co-chaired by the World Bank, the IMF, and the G20. So yeah. I should have said so it. They haven't, they haven't disappeared altogether <laughs> then. Uh, Giancarlo, first. I just want to make a remark uh, following up on the idea that the level of debt, private and public, we have now contingent, uh, you know, implicit guarantees and everything screams the importance of liquidity risk that uh, you are stressing. Our models are full of liquidity risk crisis. You just need to, to, to take them out. And that comes to my, my, my concern, which is we have seen an enormous increase in uh, reserves, international reserves, 
which are by all means a waste of uh, opportunities. And uh, the question is why we see countries that hold the reserves are reluctant to use the reserves. And the answer, if you think about it, is like, you know, the emperor naked clothes. The reserves are not about uh, smoothing fundamental risk, even large risk. The reserve is, uh, is about eliminating liquidity risk, which is endogenous. So the, you need to hold reserves not to face risks there. And the more you hold reserves, the more you feel good, but the more you hold reserves, you more, you, the more you pay a price for them. So this global cooperation at some point will become, will be the, you know, the, the, the culprit of an enormous waste of resources in terms of hospital infrastructure, wealth, welfare. So th this thing at this level of, of, of that, I think, is, is on the table and you know, ethically, politically, mentally, is something that needs to, we need to come to, to terms with it. Xavier? Did you want to? Well, no, just... Uh, I can't see you from this yeah, yeah. Uh, One uh, very quick uh, thought on, uh, on, the re on your remark on the G20 and the, on the cooperation. My um, uh, view is that all these things, um, they do not move quickly enough because of political and geopolitical constraints. And so, uh, if uh, China and the US do not cooperate more, no, if uh, the European Union does not get its act together to have a, a true international policy, um, these things will not advance. So it's just, a, I, I'm, I think we're facing the political, the political constraint. Gentlemen. So in, in response to Shetnam, um, so a lot of the fragmentation has to do with geopolitics and economic security, and we actually have a panel on that uh, tomorrow afternoon. And you know, it's kind of hard for international institutions to much do, do much about that. Uh, but there is also quite a bit of fragmentation that has to do with the use of discriminatory policies, protectionist tools that cannot be justified with economic security risks that are essentially about trying to address domestic social cohesion problems, right? Protecting losers from, for example, green transition, globalization, and so forth uh, by enacting policies that go to the expense of their peers in other countries. And in particular, sort of this a new fashion of advanced countries using nationalist policies to, in, in effect, grab um, manufacturing jobs back from emerging markets is a real problem. And, and this is something that I think uh, economists use, uh, should call out because, you know, these are fundamentally problems that should be addressed with, with non-discriminatory domestic tools. Maybe one point on Elaine, the, the EU tax observatory says that which is, I guess, based here, right here in Paris, uh, and maybe there's someone in the room that, that works for them, but their latest report says global offshore tax evasion has fallen by two-thirds over the last 10 years because of this, you know, essentially uh, Panama Papers uh, and, you know, OECD uh, efforts to, to uh, get rid of this. But, of course, the really, really wealthy are still not taxed. And from an EU fiscal space, perspective, particularly if we are looking for own resources to finance EU public goods, that creates the fascinating probability, possibility that if we are able to somehow introduce a net wealth tax at the EU level designed to really go after the point one ri uh, richest, it would be a wonderful th thing because it would not be a competition between member states and the EU for a given a pot of resources. This would be simply, this would be a tax base that right now is not taxed at all. And so even though I'm not normally an economic radical on this, I'm kind of with Gabriel Zuckman and others on this that, that are calling for, for something of that sort. Is there a Bruegel paper on this coming soon? Can we expect that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably have time for one more question. Are there any students in the room who want to ask questions? Anyone in the back maybe? We've no? Then, then we Just will allow here. people in the front to ask another question. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. No? Here. Yes. Yeah, largely an observation and uh, a question. But while, while you formulate them, remember that everyone's waiting for drinks. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. keep it succinct. Well, I would first, however, like to join others to say that I found this report very valuable with useful analysis as well as insightful conclusions and also questions for further discussion. 
Now, the report, as you know, focused on three issues, on the monetary fiscal interactions, international coordination, as well as the trade-off between debt sustainability and growth and so forth. Now, we're facing multiple targets and apparent trade-offs. And in my mind, in addressing this, it's important to use as many instruments as possible, and not only the macro instruments. And what I think it's partly a question and partly a suggestion for future work is the greater importance, not only on changing institutions, and you gave an answer about the difficulty of doing this, but also on changing market structures and market functioning as a result of continuous innovations in various sectors which are likely to change both the structure and functioning of markets and also allow us to use certain instruments to strengthen innovation, particularly in Europe, to strengthen the link between research and market and products and therefore allow us to use more instruments in order to address trade-offs between growth, state sustainability and fiscal and policy interactions. So, uh, this is an observation, but I think, oh, and fir first of all, let me also add the obvious, just one second, that in addition question, to innovation please. in various sectors, we have, of course, the big angelada, which is the AI that will not affect artificial intelligence, not only labor markets and growth prospects, but also will affect the functioning of many markets. So the question is to what extent these uh, comments uh, have a bearing on the trade-offs that we're facing and the prospects, and what can be done in a future report to address <laughs> jointly this problem? That's a fantastic, fa fantastic <laughs> question. It's a, it's a very good question. I'm going to go in reverse order and just ask you to, to share your, your reflections on this. Uh, we are pretty much out of time, so let's just do it. Sheila, you want to start? Um, I, I mean, AI is, <laughs> this is, uh, is a very difficult issue, lots needs to be done, but I agree that uh, that clearly there will be um, implications. But what I wanted to talk about uh, briefly is what you mentioned on different instruments and the need to uh, choose the types of policies that are more growth enhancing. So how do we make debt more growth enhancing? It, some of it is linked to Helen's question, you make sure that you don't have ugly debt, but then there's also the need for better um, allocation of debt by the different parts of the um, administration that actually um, uh, issues it. So. There is much more work needs to be done in understanding different types of debt and how that can be used to increase growth and productivity. And I think that's an instrument we don't use. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay, pass on to Barry. Barry. Pass on to Sam. Like when, when you create a nice instrument, actually, sometimes when you create a good instrument cooperation, like the swap lines was a good example, right? I, I, even during these inflation periods, there was enough discussion and activation there. So it's in, in a way, it is a good example of what you're doing. Messieurs, nous vous informons que le bâtiment va fermer ses portes dans quelques minutes. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you.